Good evening. Our speakers tonight are Mary and Tosh Kitagawa. They have been active in the redress movement for the Japanese Canadian community since the 1980s. Uh, they are our speakers tonight because this year is the 75th anniversary of the forced evacuation, the incarceration, actually the arrest, of more than 22,000 Japanese Canadians who were living peacefully along the coast of British Columbia when the Pearl Harbor attack precipitated the beginning of the Pacific War during the Second World War in 1942. Tosh Kitagawa is a retired businessman, Mary Kitagawa is a retired teacher. They have both been involved in educating and in uh, investigating and understanding what went on, as well as, in Mary's case, with a personal story of her own forcible removal from Salt Spring Island in 1942. Please join me in welcoming Mary and Tosh Kitagawa. Uh, good evening. Uh, I don't know why Michael has asked such old people to speak to you, but we are both humbled and honored. Having said that, I want you to know that age is very important if you're talking about wine and cheese. I would like to acknowledge that we are on unceded territory of the Coast Salish, Tsleil-Waututh, Mus Musqueam, and Squamish First Nations. I will talk about the anti-Asian environment that prevailed in BC from the time BC joined Confederation in 1871 to 1988. This would include the exploitation of Chinese labor and the building of the railroad from 1880 to 1884, and the anti-Asian riots in Vancouver in 1907. In order to understand the overt racism subjected to the Japanese Canadians prior to and during World War II, one needs to go back to Confederation. The racialization and discrimination against Asians did not begin with Canada's entry into World War II. It began on July the 20th, 1871, when BC joined Confederation. At Confederation, the British North American Act stated that control of the federal franchise would remain a provincial matter until Parliament decided otherwise. At that time, the population in British Columbia was roughly 50,000 people. Of that number, 10,000 were European whites, 40,000 were Aboriginal and Asians. Recognizing that they were vastly outnumbered, one of the first acts of the legislature was to disenfranchise Indians and Chinese. In 1895, BC passed an amendment to the Provincial Elections Act which stated, no Chinaman, Japanese, or Indian shall have his name placed on the register of voters for any electoral district or be entitled to vote in any election. This act denied all people who were non-white to practice in any profession such as law, medicine, accounting, engineering, nursing, etc. One had to be on the voters list in order to be allowed to work in the professions. The non-whites were doomed to work only in the four primary industries, farming, fishing, mining, and logging. Responding to the anti-Asian sentiment in British Columbia, the federal government passed in 1885 the Chinese Immigration Act, which stipulated that all Chinese entering Canada must first pay a $50 fee, later referred to as, as the head tax. This was amended in 1887, 1892, and 1900, with the fee increasing to its maximum of $500 in 1904. The Government of Canada collected about $33 million through this process and this would represent $321 million in 2016 dollars from about 81,000 head tax payers. This reprehensible tax system not only had the effect of constraining Chinese immigration, it prevented Chinese women and children from joining their men. The Chinese community in Canada became a bachelor society. <laughs> <laughs> 
anti-Asian hysteria continued to be rampant in both Canada and the United States along the Pacific coast. In 1905, the whites in San Francisco formed the Japan a Japanese and Korean Exclusion League. Two years later, a Canadian version appeared in Vancouver named the Asiatic Exclusion League. In a recent article for John Mackey of the Vancouver Sun, he wrote, the object of this organization is to work for the exclusion from the Dominion of Canada, its territory and its possessions. All Asiatics, by the enforcement of an act similar to the Natal Act, as uh, uh, the story appeared in the Vancouver World on August the 10th, 1907. The list of signatures was headed by Mayor Bethune and includes several members of the legal legislature and a member of the Dominion Parliament. August 13, 1907, front page of the Vancouver World featured a story on the first public meeting of the Asiatic Exclusion League. In early September of 1907, Anti-Asian riots in Bellingham started as a movement to drive Punjabi Sikhs out of the lumber industry. Soon this rioting spread north into Vancouver and angry mobs stormed through Chinatown, breaking store windows and assaulting Chinese in the area. The theme of these white supremacist rioters was White Canada. The rioters then headed to Powell Street, where they were met by angry Japanese-Canadian merchants. A confrontation ensued, and the Japanese-Canadian merchants were able to drive the rioters back. R racism in British Columbia persisted, and in 1942, 1914, excuse me, the Kumagata Maru incident involved the Japanese steamship Kumagata Maru, on which a group of citizens of India attempted to immigrate to Canada but were denied entry. The Kumagata Maru sailed from Hong Kong, then a holding of Britain, via Shanghai, China, and Yokohama, Japan, to Vancouver, carrying 376 passengers from Punjab, the British held India. Of them, 24 were admitted to Canada. But the other 352 passengers, passengers were not allowed to disembark in Canada. The ship was forced to return to India. The passengers included 340 Sikhs, 24 Muslims, and 12 Hindus, all British subjects. This is one of several in incidents in the early 20th century in which exclusion laws in Canada and in the United States were used to exclude immigrants from Asia. Um, the Chinese Immigration Act of 1923, often referred to as the Chinese Exclusion Act, effectively closed off Chinese immigration to Canada. Although immigration from the most countries was controlled or restricted in some way, only the th Chinese were so completely prohibited from immigrating. Before 1923, Chinese immigration was already heavily controlled by the Chinese Immigration Act of 1885, which placed the head tax on all immigrants from China. Established on July 1, 1923, the act had banned Chinese immigrants from entering Canada except merchants, diplomats, and foreign students. However, not only were Chinese from China banned, Ethnic Chinese with British nationality were also restricted from entering Canada. Since Dominion Day coincided with the enforcement of the Chinese Immigration Act, Chinese Canadians at the time referred to the anniversary of Confederation as Humiliation Day and refused to take any part in the celebration. To protest the Chinese Exclusion Act, Chinese Canadians closed their businesses and boycotted Dominion Day celebration every July the 1st. Beginning in the early 30s, the Japanese Canadians were starting to excel in the fishing, agriculture, and forest industry. In 
So the government began a systemic program to curtail and inhibit their success. In the fishing industry, licenses were taken away incrementally from the Japanese Canadians. Between 1931 and 1949, the Government of Canada enacted over a hundred orders in council that impacted Japanese Canadians. Beginning in 1938, the RCAP was keeping surveillance of the Japanese communities. In 1940, they reported they found no subversive activities in any of them. However, between May and August of 1941, with the passing of Order and Council PC-117, called the Oriental Registration, the RCMP began registering all people of Japanese descent over the age of 16 years. ID cards were issued, which had to be carried at all times. Three groups of Japanese uh, Canadians, uh, excuse me, the ID colors, cards were color-coded to identify the three groups of Japanese Canadians. Buff-colored cards identified the Japanese national, the salmon pink card were for the naturalized, and the white cards were for the Canadian born. It was mandatory to carry these cards at all times. Failure to show it was stopped by the police outside of your property meant at least six months in jail. This was done eight months before December the 7th, 1941. Thus, the government knew where every Japanese Canadian family lived. To give you an idea how quickly the provincial government acted on incarceration of the Japanese Canadians, on December the 8th, which was a day after Pearl Harbor, 1,200 fishing boats were impounded and towed to Andyville along the Fraser River. And there was a series of, of orders and councils passed uh, until March the 25th. In other words, there was one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine orders and council uh, that uh, led to uh, the beginning of the incarceration program. Uh, from this you know that the governments don't move that quickly. So there was something in the wind uh, long before Pearl Harbor. When Canada joined the Pacific War, Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King invoked the All-Powerful War Measures Act without going through Parliament. This enabled the government to act without discussion or debate. Essentially, it was a rule by decree, which is a style of governance allowing quick, unchallenged creation of law by a single person or group. It is used primarily by dictators, absolute monarchs, and military leaders. The War Measures Act gave sweeping emergency powers to the federal cabinet, allowing it to govern by decree when it perceived the existence of war invasion or insurrection, real or apprehended. It was used to limit the freedom of Canadians in both world wars. Immediately, the government began the mass incarceration program to remove all people of the Japanese race from BC, regardless of whether the person was born in Canada or had citizenship. The military and the RCMP tried to convince the Prime Minister that Japanese Canadians pose no threat to the security of Canada and should not be removed from their homes. However, countless orders and councils were passed to uproot 23,427 innocent, hard-working, loyal citizens from the BC coast. The motto of the BC politicians was, no Japs from the Rockies to the sea. The following quote from a BC politician reveals the vehement hatred many politicians from BC had for people of Japanese descent. It is the government's plan to get these people out of BC as fast as possible. It is my personal intention, as long as I remain in public life, to see they never come back here. Let our slogan be for British Columbia, no Japs from the Rockies to the seas. That was Ian McKenzie as an MP for the federal government. 
On January the 8th, 1942, a conference on the Japanese problem was held in Ottawa, along with delegates from BC, where Lieutenant General Maurice Pope and Dep diplomat Escott Reed. In Lieutenant General Maurice Pope's book, Soldiers and Politicians and Memoir, he wrote, when I agreed with the RCMP and the military that the Japanese Canadians posed no threat to the security of the nation, all hell broke loose. I was afraid that the BC politicians were going to charge across the table to manhandle me. The rage was a sight to behold. One BC delegate conceded privately to him that the war offered a heaven sent opportunity to rid themselves of the Japanese economic race forevermore. Lieutenant General Pope understood then that this exercise had nothing to do with security. It was just a myth. He said that he left that meeting feeling dirty all over. In Escott Reed's book, Rad Radical Mandarin, the memoirs of Escott Reed, who was a special assistant to the external affairs recalls. They spoke of the Japanese Canadians in the way that the Nazis would have spoken about the Jewish Germans. When they spoke, I felt that committee room, the physical presence of evil. Muriel Kitagawa, in no relation, writes in her book, This is My Own, which is a series of letters to her brother Wes. The bitterness the anguish is complete, wrote Kitagawa. You who deal in lifeless figures, files and statistics could never measure the depth of hurt and outrage dealt out to those of us who love this land. It is because we are Canadians that we protest the violation of our birthright. Mary will detail the horrendous experiences that our family endured from early 1942 to 1949. The war in Europe ended on, in May of 1945, and the war in the Pacific officially ended after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August the 15th, 1945. The War Measures Act was in force until December 31st, 1945. This meant that the government would have to release all of the internees from the various camps and sugar beet fields. Knowing this, they hastily passed the National Emergency Transitional, Transitional Powers Act 1945, which took effect on January the 1st, 1946. This allowed them to keep us uh, on the beet fields and, and in the camps. This, mark, this act was in force until March the 31st, 1947. Immediately, they passed the Continuation of Transitional Measures Act 1947, which allowed the government to maintain certain wartime orders and regulations and stayed in place until April 30, 1951. The U.S. and Canadian governments treated their citizens quite differently. When World War II officially ended on September 2, 1945, all Japanese Americans were free to return to their homes, which in large part were still registered in their names. In December 1944, President Roosevelt rescinded Executive Order 9066, and the WRA, which is an acronym for War Location Authority. They began a six-month process of releasing internees often to resettlement facilities and temporary housing and shutting down the camps. In August 1945, the war was over. By 1946, the camps were closed and all of the internees were released to rebuild their lives. However, in Canada, the Japanese Canadians were still confined to the incarceration camps or the sugar beet fields in Alberta and Manitoba. As explained earlier, the War Measures Act was invoked and was in force from August 25, 1939 until December 31, 1945, after which the National Emergency Transitional Powers Act was in force until March 31, 1947. 
Then the Constitutional Transitional Measures Act was enacted, maintaining certain wartime orders and regulations and stayed in place until April the 30th, 1951. The reason Canada did not re renew this act was because Eleanor Roosevelt was organizing a group of countries, including Canada, to draft a Human Rights Act through the newly formed United Nations in 1945. She chose John Humphrey, a Canadian law professor, to draft this document. After two years, the document to be called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was prepared for adoption at the UN. Canada, along with the Soviet bloc, abstained in the first round of voting on December the 7th, 1948. They worried that it would give rights to communists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Japanese Canadians, and Aboriginal Canadians. Canada also opposed economic and social rights. It only voted for the actual declaration on December the 10th because its earlier abstention was so embarrassing. Such was the despicable behavior of the government of the day. Another major issue was the repatriation and loyalty survey. The government was attempting to rid the Japanese Canadians from Canada since 1942. Racist politicians in British Columbia were relentless in their drive to remove all people of Japanese descent from British Columbia. They were led by Ian Alistair McKenzie. The group included McGregor McIntosh, representing the islands, A.W. Neal, representing Comox Alberni, Thomas Reed, representing New Westminster, Howard Green, representing Vancouver Centre, and councillors Alderman Halford Wilson and George Buscombe. Officials created a questionnaire to distinguish loyal from disloyal internees and give internees the cho choice to move east of the Rockies immediately or be repatriated to Japan at the end of the war. Some 10,000 unable to move on short notice or simply hesitant to remain in Canada after their wartime experiences chose deportation. The government stressed that this was a strictly voluntary and that no pressure whatsoever was being exerted. The same issue was handled much differently in the United States. I just want to read you a direct passage from Ann Sunahara's book, the politics of racism. In December 1944, however, the federal government panicked. The United States Constitution had finally freed Japanese Americans. Ruling on a petition of habeas corpus filed by civil rights lawyer James Purcell on behalf of a former California state employee, Mitsue Endo, the United States Supreme Court ruled that loyal Americans could not be denied freedom of movement. Neither Mitsuo Endo nor any other Japanese American could be denied access to any area open to other Americans. Anticipating this judicial decision, the American authorities announced in December 1944 that Japanese Americans could return to their homes on the Pacific Coast as of January the 2nd, 1945. The deportation of Japanese Canadians began in May 1946, but many hundreds had second thoughts and balked at the for forced removal. Under intense pressure from a newly formed organization called Cooperative Committee on Japanese Canadians, the government relented. In 1947, those that were not deported to Japan were allowed to remain. By this time, 3,964 Japanese Canadians had already been exiled. Again in 1947, under intense pressure from many politicians and academics, the federal government revoked the legislation to repatriate the remaining Japanese Canadians to Japan. It was only in April 1949 that all restrictions were lifted from Japanese Canadians and they gained franchise and freedom of movement. 
On September 26, 1988, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney signed the redress agreement and apologized to all members of our community for the despicable treatment the government inflicted on us. He further stated that tra treatment of Japanese Canadians was morally and legally unjust. Thus ended an ugly chapter in Canadian history. As a footnote, we see a dangerous parallel in the United States under the government headed by President Donald Trump. The present DACA, which is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, has the same elements that led to our inca incarceration. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm so glad to see all of you here. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish and Squamish, Sables Tooth, and the Musqueam Nations. The story that I'm going to reveal to you today is a Canadian story. It's about a Canadian family. I hope that the information that is presented today will help you to understand how one family, mine, survived the horrors of the uprooting, dispossession, incarceration, imprisonment, and the enslavement by a democratic country called Canada. I was born on Salt Spring Island. My mother, Kimiko Okanomurakami, was born in Steveston. My father, Katsuyori Murakami, was born in Hiroshima, Japan, and came to Canada in 1927. I have three sisters and a brother. My youngest brother, born in the prison camp, died in 2008. He was only 64 years old. Our family history in Canada began in 1896 when my maternal grandfather, Kumanosuke Okano, came to Canada as a young man 121 years ago. My grandmother, Ryo Kimura Okano, followed in 1903 as a picture bride. Initially, they worked in the forest, but turned to fishing when my mother was born. In order to be fishers, they were naturalized and became British subjects. Their successes in the fishing industry enabled them to own five boats. In order to keep their growing family safe after one child drowned, they sold their boats and bought 200 acres of prime land on Salt Spring Island in 1922. It consisted of virgin timber, a lush valley, and a seafront. They became successful farmers growing tomatoes in six large greenhouses, varieties of uh, ber berries and vegetables. Their two-story house was filled with the latest appliances and beautiful furniture. They were retired by 1941. Leaving the labor to their two adult sons and several sponsored immigrants from Japan. My family lived across the road on Sharp, Sharp Road from my grandparents on 17 acres that my father cleared all by himself. He toppled huge trees, dynamited the stumps, and plowed the land it was a physically challenging task. My parents grew asparagus, strawberries, cane berries, and vegetables. Father built six large chicken houses to accommodate 5,000 egg-laying hens. During the summer, they hired Japanese-Canadian women from Vancouver Island to help with the harvest. In order for them to bring their children my father built a bunkhouse to look af, uh, to uh, help them stay together. My parents um, worked hard and sacrifices enabled us to live a carefree life. 
The harvest of 1942 was going to allow them to buy more land and add more luxuries, even a tennis court for my oldest sister. I find it amazing that my grandparents and parents were able to achieve that level of success when so many laws were passed by the BC legislature against Asian people to curtail their advancement. At that time, it was legal to discriminate against people of Asian descent and First Nations. Through the maze of countless orders and council, Asian people persevered. They continued to work hard and obeyed the laws and continued to contribute to the welfare of the larger community. When Japanese Canadians began succeeding in fishing and farming, they were accused of unfair competition, working too hard for too long hours and less pay. They were paid less because the white people decided that Japanese didn't need as much money because they had a lower standard of living. In the eyes of the dominant society, the non-whites were classified as second-class citizens, incapable of assimilating and the inability to learn English. When Order and Council PC 117 was passed called the Oriental Registration, all the Japanese Canadian people on Salt Spring Island went over the age of 16, went to Victoria to register. My grandparents, who were naturalized citizens, were issued the salmon pink cards. My uncles, who were Canadian born, were issued white cards. And my father, who was a national, was issued a buff colored card, as did my mother, who was born in Canada. They reasoned that since she was married to a national, she no longer was born in Canada. Amazing. This all happened eight months before Pearl Harbor was bombed. On the day Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese Air Force, my father had just returned from the hospital after a surgery. When he heard what had happened, he said, stupid, how can a small country like Japan expect to beat a large, powerful country like the United States. He felt that nothing good will result from this event, and he was right. At school the next day, my 13-year-old sister was accused by her teachers of starting the war. All the students turned toward her as the teacher pointed an accusing finger at her. On the way home, she was bombarded with rocks thrown by boys who chased her until she disappeared into the forest. She was bloodied, but not wanting to worry her parents, she washed the blood out of her hair and body in the chicken house and went into the house. We were not allowed to go to school or church after that. On March 17, 1942, we watched an RCMP pickup truck speed into our yard. The officer came to arrest my father. My mother, knowing that such a day would arrive, had his clothing all packed in this large clothes bag. Father hurriedly assured us that he will be fine, but we felt otherwise. As we watched the officer roughly shove my father onto the pickup truck, father quickly stood up and told us that he was all right. However, our hearts were beating wildly as we noticed the gun in the officer's holster. We were terrified that our gentle, hardworking, loving father was being taken away to be shot. My mother stood still, watching this unbelievable scene, holding tightly to my one-and-a-half-year-old brother. I am sure that every cell in her body was exploding with pain. As the officer jerked the truck into gear, 
My father nearly fed up, fell again. The four of us girls ran after the truck, crying, Daddy, Daddy, come back. With tears flooding our eyes, we chased the truck until it disappeared into a void. But there was no time to grieve. My mother had many tasks to perform. Look after the 5,000 chickens, gather the eggs, prepare them for market, tend to her children's needs, and look after the crops. Fortunately, my 13-year-old sister was mature, way beyond her age. She stepped into father's vacant shoes and took over. When the custodian of enemy alien property came to give orders to my mother, he also brought a document that he wanted her to sign. It said that the government will look after our property in trust until our return after the war. Since my mother knew this agent since he was just a lad, she trusted him. He told her that not one chopstick will be missing from her house when she returned. Of course, she signed. His orders were for her, to, for her to get rid of the chickens and to pack all of her belongings into one large room. With a heavy heart, she sold all of the chickens to some Chinese merchants from Victoria who heard about my mother's dilemma. These were the chickens that she hatched from the egg stage in her incubators and nurtured them to the egg laying stage. And then we were told to wait for the next order. That day came for all remaining 72 Japanese Canadians on April the 21st, 1942. Four other men were taken away earlier with my father. The women became reluctant single parents to young children. Mother dressed us in our very best clothes and made sure that our shoes were polished as we waited outside for a friend, Mr. Gardner, to take us away. The ominous silence engulfed us. There were no, there were no longer any sounds of life, the clucking of chickens, the cheerful voices of adults at work and the children at play, along with the barking of our beloved dog, Mune that we had to give away. In this silence, we waited. Mr. Gardner drove us to the wharf in Ganges, the largest town on the island. We saw piles of clothes bags and suitcases belonging to the soon-to-be exiles. These departing families did not know at that time that they would never see their beloved homes ever again. The three final ship, the Princess Mary, took us to Vancouver as the darkest of night descended upon us. We were taken to Hastings Park and registered. To our horror, we were instructed to go into the animal barn, which was vacated by the animals not long before our arrival. The pungent smell of urine and feces assaulted our nostrils, and the sea of bunk beds greeted our unbelieving eyes. 3,000 women and children were being housed there. The men and boys, 12 years and older, were housed in the forum. My grandfather, who was in a state of shock even before we left the island, was separated from my grandmother, who was in the barn with us. On each bunk was a large bag filled with straw, which became our mattress two army blank and two army blankets. The bunks were so tightly packed together that in order to find some privacy among strangers, blankets and sheets were strung along the railings. Some families had to live in the animal stalls where maggots were still crawling out from between the boards. Our toilet, well, <clears throat> were, uh, were the troughs with the running water that once carried away animal waste. Lime was spread 
around the trough to deaden the smell, but it made it worse. Poor food, unpalatable food was served to us on tin plates in the poultry section of the barn. Hundreds of people got diarrhea and food poisoning. Mother kept us out of the barn as much as possible during the day to air out our hair, clothing, and skin. At night, we heard the anguished cries of the elderly women who were totally lost without their husbands and family. We worried about our grandfather, who was not allowed to contact our grandmother, including the men and boys over 8,000 inmates passed through Hastings Park. After two and a half weeks in this hellhole, we were sent to Greenwood, BC, a nearly abandoned mining town. We lived in a tiny room um, in a building that was emptied when the miners left. While there, mother received a heavily censored letter from father letting us know that he was working, building roads with pick and shovel with hundred other men separated from their families. We were so relieved to learn that he was still alive. A $20 bill fell out of the envelope. The men were paid 25 cents an hour. After paying room and board while living in crowded railway boxcars or tents, the men were ordered to send $20 to their families for their keep each month. My father was in the Yellowhead camp just inside the BC Alberta border. There were a hundred men in each camp stretching all the way from Yellowhead to Blue River, BC. In July of 1942, the married men were told that if they agreed to go to the prairies to work on the sugar beet farm, they would be able to reunite with their families. Father left the camp on July the 21st of 1942 and went to join our grandparents and their family toiling on the Keeler farm. It was very difficult for my grandparents because they were so elderly, <clears throat> but they were expected to work like the others. We had a joyful reunion on August the 15th, six months after father disappeared. The next day was the beginning of a nightmare for our family. At the Jensen farm where we were assigned, we were unceremoniously deposited in front of a tiny 10 by 15 shack, literally an empty box beside a pig pen. There were no beds or cooking facilities. Father had to use his own money to buy lumber to build bunk beds along the walls. So at least we had a place to sleep. Mother fed us mostly from cans because she could not prepare food without a stove. Our water supply was the pond that we shared with the animals. With no laundry or bathing facility, we, co <coughs> excuse me. we depended on the pond to keep us clean. After living and working there for several months, my parents felt that if we continued to live in that condition, we would surely all die. My sister wrote an impassioned letter to the representative of the BC Securities Commission in Lethbridge, Alberta, describing our plight. He came one hot day, looked at the shack, and promised to move us to one of the incarceration camps in BC dotted along the eastern side of Slocan Lake. With an RCMP escort, we arrived in Bay Farm on November 1942. From there, we moved to Popov, then to a tent in Slocan. The snow was very deep and inside the tent was very cold. We were fed in the communal hall where we were able to keep warm for part of the day at least. The outhouse was a distance away. I do not know how my parents coped 
with a baby still in diapers and four young children crammed into that small tent. On January 1, 1943, we were moved to a newly created camp called Roseberry, situated on the northern edge of Slocan Lake, where unfinished tar paper shacks awaited us. In the audience is a lady who lived across from us as children, so she probably knows all that I'm saying. We may as well have been asked to live in a basket. The icy air seeped in through the floorboards from ill-fitting windows and handmade doors. There were no minor inner walls or any insulation. The 14 by 28 shack was divided into three rooms, bedrooms on each side of the middle common room. Now this 14 by 28 shack would fit into our present living room and we would have enough uh, space on the side to grow vegetables. There were two double bunk beds on each uh, bedroom. The small middle room was used as a kitchen, laundry and eating area. There was a tiny two burner wood burning stove, kitchen stove and a wooden sink. In the center room was a small oval tin stove that burned raw wet wood to heat the whole shack. When we woke up in the winter morning, our bedding would be frozen to the sheet of ice covering the wall. We all went to bed early because six candles could not light up the night for us very long. When spring arrived, it was a relief to feel the warmth of the sun. All the fathers went into the forest to harvest cedar logs which they split into shakes to cover the outer wall, which was still covered with tar paper. That summer, electricity was installed for us with one bare bulb in each room. Later, water was piped into the kitchen sink. We ate in two shifts because the small table would not accommodate seven of us all at once. Order in Council PC 469 shocked my parents. It empowered the custodian of enemy property to dispose of our property without their consent. The government reneged on their promise to return our property after the war. The small amount of money given to us after the sale was deposited in our frozen bank account, which my parents could not access themselves. A small amount was doled out to us each month to keep us alive. Even when my youngest brother was born in Roseberry, they would not give us a penny more for his diapers and clothes. We paid for our own imprisonment. A loyalty service survey in 1945 was given to all internee families. The ultimatum given was, go east of the Rockies or be repatriated to Japan. Most of those who signed to go to Japan were deported because you cannot repatriate someone to a country that they have never been to and remaining in BC was not an option. Because we chose to remain in Canada, our family was moved to New Denver five miles south of Roseberry. We lived there for one year until May of 1946, eight months after the Pacific War had ended. Father wanted to stay as close to BC as possible. He felt that Canada would come to her senses one day and allow us back to Salt Spring Island. Reluctantly, we went back to the dreaded sugar beet farm, which I would call slave labor. We went to McGrath because we were not allowed to stay in BC. But by then, we were destitute because the government had emptied our bank account. My oldest sister, who wanted to attend university, had to go to work at a grocery store. Her income was crucial to our survival.
The farmer would not pay for my parents' labor until after the harvest late in the year. My parents walked five miles to and five miles back from the field each day. When my mother injured her right hip, she still had to go to work. In the twilight, as we watched them coming home, we could see her dragging her right leg as she made her way home. There was no hot bath to ease her pain. In the summer months, my two sisters and I looked after our two younger brothers and cooked the meals. We often put our two brothers on a wagon and took them to the field so that our parents would not worry. We moved twice more after that, first to another farm in McGrath, and that's another story of suffering, which I, cannot, I won't tell today, and then to Cardston to run a restaurant run by my uncle. We saved em enough money in five years and were able to return to Salt Spring Island in 1954. We met with vile racism and death threats. But this story is for another time. Our parents were a powerful team. They were our role models. They taught us never to quietly accept the cruel onslaught of racial hatred, never to act as victim, always show a proud face to the world, never a face of defeat. They showed us to be gentle to be generous and compassionate toward others. They provided security and created opportunities for us. They believed strongly in education and allowed four of us to go through university. Throughout their lives, they were truly honorable and loyal citizens of Canada. With dignity and courage, our parents brought the family through some terrible, terrible times in our journey through life and ensure that our family prevailed. Now that's the end of the story about my family. However, I was asked to talk a little bit about this building on 401 Burrard Street. Originally, it was named Howard, Gra Howard Green Building. On September the 13th, 2006, I read an article in the Vancouver Sun that a 19-story federal office building was named after Howard Charles Green, former Conservative MP representing Vancouver Quadra in the John Diefenbaker government. At the dedication ceremony, Honorable Michael Fortier, Minister of Public Works and Government Services, praised Howard Green for his services to Canada, but he failed to mention that he was a vile racist who helped to spearhead the destruction of the Japanese-Canadian community. When I saw Howard Green's name, it triggered memories of many conversations our family had about BC politicians when I was a young child. I sent a friend to the Vancouver Public Library to get as many newspaper headlines attributed to Howard Green. It was a time-consuming exercise, so he stopped after filling two pages. However, it was enough to know that Howard Green hated people of Japanese descent. I immediately wrote to Minister Fortier to refresh his memory of what Prime Minister Brian Mulroney said on September the 22nd, 1988, when redress was won by our community. I quote in part, Mr. Speaker, not only was the tr treatment inflicted on Japanese Canadians during the war both morally and legally unjustified, it went against the very nature of our country. Canada. I questioned Mr. Fortier why the same government under Stephen Harper would honor one of the most powerful architects of hate who helped to send 
22,000 innocent Canadians into exile by naming a federal building on 401 Burrard Street after Howard Charles Green. I reminded him that if his staff had done some thorough research into the life of Mr. Green, they probably would not have chosen him. The idea of removing Mr. Green's name from the building met with a lot of backlash from the Senate and politicians. I heard my name repeated over and over in the Senate in Ottawa. How dare she do such a thing? However, we, the members of our community, persevered with the help of other ethnic and Caucasian advocates. We did succeed in replacing Howard Green's name with Douglas Jung's, the first Chinese Canadian member of Parliament in Canada on September the 7th, 2007. And this is a, just a short blurb about the, the honorary degree ceremony at UBC for the 76 Japanese Canadian students who were expelled in 1942. In 1942, there were 76 UBC students of Japanese descent who were expelled from campus. First, the male students belonging to the Canadian Officers Training Corps was told to hand in their uniforms by the top UBC administrators. One told them, we don't want any Japs on campus. They were devastated. Then all of them were told that they must leave the campus. Only two professors stood up for them and tried to help them complete the year and for some to graduate. They were Henry Angus and E.H. Morrill. However, the students were prevented from continuing. When I saw all the American University presenting honorary degrees to their former students, I wrote first a letter to UBC President Stephen Toop on May of 2008 to see if UBC could do the same. Since the Senate, Senate Tributes Committee deals with such matters, he sent my letter to them. My request was refused outright because the chair said, those former students do not qualify. When I read her letter, initial letter and uh, following emails, I realized that she did not know the history of Japanese Canadians, especially after 1942. It took three and a half years trying to convince them that UBC was culpable in not defending her own students at that time. The process was a long and frustrating journey for my husband and me. UBC reacted only when we went to the media to share our struggles with the public. On November the 17th, 2011, UBC finally voted to honor these former students. They agreed to a special honorary degree ceremony to create an educational component to educate future students about this dark past and to digitize historical documents. On May the 30th, 2012, a most memorable convocation took part, place at the Chan Center. Only 10 of the 76 students attended to receive their diploma and hood. There were only 23 still alive on that day. The youngest at that time was 89 years old. Those who could not attend were too frail to travel, but they were able to watch the ceremony because it was live streamed across Canada. Today, there are only nine students left. And last week, Tosh and I went to Toronto to film uh, five students, and they were so frail. However, we were so pleased to see them again. So thank you for listening to my long story.